Hello everyone, welcome to an all new episode of the Indic Paradigm on the Indic Explorer channel. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. Uh, we need all your support for our channel. It's a growing and fledging channel. So yeah, continue with your support and love. Uh, coming back to the topic of today's discussion. The industrial revolution brought a lot of change in terms of the manufacturing process and post industrialization as well. There were multiple stages in the manufacturing process where it kept evolving until it has now reached the digital age. The next stage of industrialization is supposed to be through a new technology called 3D printing. So to understand the changes that are going to take place in a future world of 3D printing, especially from the socio-cultural perspective, I have with me a very distinguished guest for the first time on the Indic Explorer channel, Mr. Abhijit Ayer Doron Mitra. Welcome to the show, Abhijit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. So, Abhijit, before we go into the subject of 3D printing, could you just give a brief walkthrough of the different stages through which the, you know, industrialization, the industrial manufacturing process has evolved till the time we've reached today? Sure. So, see, for me, industrialization is the application of chemical energy to the manufacturing process. Right. And... It, of course, got first applied to war sometime in 1100 or 1200. Uh, cannons and early mortars and muskets and what have you. And it completely changed the nature of warfare, right? Fortifications went completely out of fashion to the point now that cities are built without any walls and things like that, right? So that changed completely. But it took another 400 odd years to end up to introduce the chemical process to manufacturing. And it first starts in England with coal extraction, specifically to take water out of coal mines in the UK. Now, anybody who's been to the UK knows that it keeps raining. You know, there's that famous uh, 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 joke in Asterix in Britain uh, that, you know, in Britain, when uh, it isn't raining, it's foggy. And when there's no fog, there's rain. So that's the kind of place you're in. And the coal mines used to get flooded. So you had to keep removing the water from there. And they found that, you know, using a coal powered vacuum kind of a machine was fantastic in removing water from this. And then, of course, they thought, why not apply it to everything else? Now, why is this important? Uh, see, it's really simple. If any of you have a car that's ever gotten stuck in a uh I won't say a ditch, but a little pothole or something like that, where you're not able to get it out. You need to get, depending on the size of your car, if you've got a little, uh, you know, Maruti 800 kind of car, then it'll take you at least four or five people to push it out and two, three people just to lift the front part or the back part, whatever has gone into the pothole up. So you need what? Something like about eight people to do it. On the other hand, if you have another Maruti 800, you literally just have to push bumper to bumper and that one car can push that entire car out. No lifting required. You just push, push, push. And hopefully with some skill, the guy pushing you out will not get stuck in the same pothole. Okay. So look at the human savings that you have, the job savings that you have. There's no need to lift and there's no need for four or five people to push. And it happens like this, because remember that other car pushing you out is a matter of like 10, 12 seconds, as opposed to human beings lifting and pushing you out, which is a matter of a few minutes at least and several tries. Right. Now you increase the power load, it increases exponentially. So by the 1700s, by the beginning of the 1700s, for example, while the British had set up in Calcutta, uh, the production process had become so advanced that, you know, Indian armies had variable guns of different calibers, muskets mostly, uh, maybe a few thousand. And yet by about 1750, the British had already stocked up a million, one million rifles in Calcutta. Right. 
and it's just that sheer level of upscaling that it brings then what you have is the precision it brings about when you've got the same mold everything working to the same process there's a certain uniformity that you create as opposed to handheld so simple example if any one owns or if you haven't owned then at least driven in a rolls royce everything is clunky and uh you know there is imperfections everywhere because it's all hand stitched and hand welded and hand made and things like that which i honestly don't like on the other hand if you look at a mercedes which makes no bones about being machine made everything is exactly perfect and precise so that standardization comes in so you know the uh uh, uh unpredictability goes away so first you had mass then you had precision right and this then becomes a monster that you can't control till you then have the coal engine and then the uh, uh, for uh, for mobility and then the diesel engine for uh, even faster mobility and more efficient because you know coal you need to have the first 3 4 uh, carts in the train have to be coal just to take the coal to transport it and you still have people who need to shovel the coal through and then shovel it into the engine diesel it's all automated so there where you needed one driver one shoveler and you know six seven other shovelers to keep bringing the coal up from the back you suddenly move to diesel which is just one pipe so just one driver you don't even need the uh, he does the fuel injection or whatever required <clears throat> so even there you see these efficiencies improving uh it's most remarkably illustrated in the textile process uh which you know is a very sore point with indians that the british came and destroyed our textiles and things like power that power loom the power loom is what destroyed it was industrialization that destroyed right. indian industry because you know people most people fine maharajas will want like even today uh it is a maharaja level person an ambani or an adani who can afford a rolls royce you and i cannot afford a rolls royce and so we're very happy with say uh, a suzuki urban Cru- grand vitara or whatever it's called uh and like that people in those days just saw hey cheap cloth which looks like a double ikat or a single ikat or maybe nothing at all just plain cloth but it's a cloth i can wear that is so cheap right uh so what china did to electronics manufacturing essentially britain did to textiles manufacturing in india it is a very natural process uh and that's what those are the phases of industrialization and it doesn't really th- there's a move towards more efficiency till natural market forces now what it does is it creates so much wealth that there is trickle down and the market keeps expanding right now the british never learned this lesson the americans learned this lesson the british practice mercantilism which is you have all these colonies you keep them deliberately suppressed so that they will be forced to buy british products on the other hand if they had seen that india is a market whose propensity to consume needed to be increased india would have ended up buying more british products which is what american capitalism did which british mercantilism uh, mercantilism failed to do and that is why the british empire collapsed and you know pax americana starts without the need for an empire uh in fact they would much rather prefer not to sink in costs of an occupation and instead push money into you like the marshall plan to grow your economy and see capitalism produces this kind of altruism where america for its own selfish interests rebuilds europe rebuilds japan rebuilds germany hmm. uh and it was the same capitalist selfish enlightened self interest that led to the abolition of slavery in america because it was the rich north that needed now remember quality is a function of labor okay if you've got unmotivated bad labor there is always going to be glitches in your quality on the other hand when you have paid motivated labor your quality is always going to be better and better and better and better right and so america northern america needed 
because it had moved towards industry, it needed that quality. Whereas Southern agrarian America needed cheaper people to pluck cotton who needed to be fed less so that there was more agricultural surplus left over, etc., etc., etc. So industrialization creates, it was like, you know, how Egypt built the pyramids, but the pyramids built Egypt because it created certain economies of scale in stone quarrying, in river transportation, in construction, in design, in language, in mathematics, or rather applicable mathematical calculations and applicable astronomy, uh, uh, rather than being, you know, uh, uh, esoteric stuff. It creates economies. Right. And that's the kind of growth, constant, near constant. I mean, infinite growth is, uh, I think it's a myth. At some point, even this will come crashing down. I think you're already seeing it, uh, you know, where uh, uh, you move to a debt based economy. Uh, I, I For me, that's very dangerous. Uh, but because, you, you know, you're essentially living off wealth that hasn't been created. Uh, notional wealth. Not, not a good idea. Uh, but you see this happen. And then the big change happens in the 80s where you move towards digital because your constant improvement of quality, quality, quality to make things cheaper moves you towards digitization, uh, microchips, etc., etc., etc. And finally, the information age that brings communications together. So what ends up happening is today, you, this is my phone, okay? Uh, this kind of power of communication, uh, Winston Churchill did not have, uh, FDR, the president of America did not have, Stalin did not have. I can literally write a note, call up anyone at in any part of the world for free on WhatsApp or Signal or Telegram. I can make out a whole document. I can send it out wirelessly to print and I don't even need to print it. I can actually disseminate it in a second to many more millions of people, say, through my Twitter or my Facebook or whatever, than, you know, uh, airdropping leaflets on people required. I mean, look at the effort airdropping of leaflets required, which I don't. So see, it's it's the kind of exponential increases that information, digitization, uh, 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 petroleum-based fuels, and before that, coal-based fuels brought to the entire process. That, for me, is what industrialization is. Okay. So, now, start standing where we are, uh, like you always mention about 3D printing, uh, what do you, uh, firstly, what is the basic technology of 3D printing and uh, what does it change in the manufacturing process? Okay. So uh, think of 3D printing essentially as printing. Okay. Just, you know, where the A, B, C, D, E comes about, it's layered on top of uh, each other through different materials that you use. Now, what we're looking at is, a, uh, what we look at now is multi-material printing, which is still quite uh, uh, difficult to do. Uh, when you have single material printing, for example, even today, uh, if you go to the Pirate Bay, you can download a fungible called Build Your Own Piston. And with that basic single material 3D printing process, you can build your own pistol. And if you manage to lay your hands on gunpowder, you can make a single fire bullet and build a pistol at home. Okay. Uh, the thing is, where are you going to get that gunpowder that goes into that bullet? And you have to get the bullet from somewhere else because the bullet is explosive. It has that issue of the way a gun works is there's an explosion and it's directed out in one way. So is this strong enough to hold that? How much gunpowder do you have to put in? Today, the challenge is getting that multi-material printing done. And see, 3D printing can get you basic plastic warmed up, but to form a copper bullet, you need much higher temperatures. Uh, then when you're building, if you're printing up a bullet, how do you print up molten copper around it to form the body and at the same time layer the gunpowder inside it? It's not gunpowder, but whatever, propellant inside, explosive propellant inside it without igniting it. Right. So I'm 
talking about this at a very basic level. And this is why multi-material printing is tough. On the other hand, if you're not talking about guns, uh, what happens today is things get produced in different areas. The transportation chain brings it together. And at the assembly factory, everything is put together by hand or by machine. But it has to be layered in a way that either a human or a machine can reach into. So it loses space efficiency. Whereas in 3D printing, where there is no need for a human hand to reach into it, the same reason that a CAD drawing is much easier to do than actually building the building or the submarine or the ship or whatever that you've done the CAD drawing of. Because in a CAD, you're just layering things up one drawing after the other. You know, the way a cartoon is made, it's different drawings of different people in different sequences. And then you, uh, you know, do this putt, 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 putt with the book and it seems like a moving cartoon, which is essentially what a, uh, uh, this thing is. Uh, so it makes the entire process easier. The question is, how do you get one machine to do everything? So, for example, I'm talking to you on a computer which has a metal frame but has microchips and semiconductors and God knows what not inside of it and plastic. How does the same machine print everything layered? It can't. Uh, with technology today, it can't. So what is the first thing that will probably get 3D printed? It's the easiest things to manufacture, like uh, cups. Uh, even lighters would be complex because this contains fuel inside. So when you mold the plastic outside with heat, you dare not put the lighter fluid inside it at the same time. And so it has to be a two-stage process where you 3D print the lighter, but the fuel gets inserted in there later. Right. So how do you solve these design problems? Now, but what 3D printing does is when you achieve that, when you achieve that process, it reduces your transportation chains where you only need the raw materials required. It doesn't need to be processed elsewhere. It simplifies. So the way I told you in the first part, in the first question you asked me, how coal had to be shoveled from three trucks away right to the front of the train and you needed one guy to put it. What 3D printing does is it simplifies that entire supply chain logistical process and the uh, sort of layering process. But the first things that will get built are invariably something like toothbrushes or light bulbs, right? Because glass requires a certain heat to frame and the tungsten requires the tungsten or the whatever uh, uh, metal it is inside requires a different heat and the argon gas or whatever neutral gas is there in between. You can kind of pump in at the end with the same heat mechanism, seal it in. So I suspect it's the easiest things that will get 3D printed first. So low end manufacturing will be replacing. Correct. It. Will get replaced. Essentially. First. Right. And this is why it's a problem for us. Because we haven't reached medium end uh, uh, processing like China has. But China still makes a lot of its money through low end processing. So China will get screwed at, at least a significant section because even today, I yeah. bet you this lighter is made in China. Huh? Uh, I'm sure it is. So a lot of their toothbrushes, huh. their uh, toilet seats, their lighters, their whatever will go out of business. All the flags that they manufacture, the uh, toys that they manufacture, they, those will go out of business first because they're easiest to manufacture. Their textiles will go first. Our textiles will also go. Uh, but see, India is still at the low end manufacturing chain. The only high-end manufacturing beat the first semiconductor factory or the iPhone factory is actually a Taiwanese factory simply based in India. Right. Uh, we'll get there slowly as 3D printing gets more and more and more sophisticated. I mean, in the beginning, first they said, you know, flight is impossible. Then when the Wright brothers flew, they said, oh, well, flying long distances is, is impossible. Uh, uh, then they said supersonic travel was impossible. You make everything possible. Today, who would have thought once upon a time if you had to go from London to India by plane? You had to go from London to Paris, uh, Paris to uh, Nice, Nice to Rome, uh, uh, Rome to Sicily, 
from Sicily, it had to do a very dangerous crossing over the sea. And most people avoided that. So they used to go through, uh, you know, Romania, Turkey. In those days, Romania, Thani, but whatever. was, I think it was still the Ottoman Empire or, or whatever. Down south into Baghdad. Then from Baghdad to uh, uh, someplace in Iran. Then a second stop in Iran, a third stop in Iran. Then to Karachi. Uh, uh, then from Karachi to someplace else. Then to uh, Bombay, etc., etc. And very frequently, that would take you about two, three weeks to travel, which was still much faster than a ship. Uh, not two, three weeks, but uh, about three, four days to travel, which was still much faster than a ship, a ship that would take several weeks. And you had to make yeah. provisions for, because it was so expensive, you had to make provisions for caviar and foie gras and chilled champagne in the middle of the desert with nobody coming there, which was a huge expense. Today, you can fly from Delhi to New York in 12 and a half hours, 12 and a half, 13 hours, direct flight. And the cost of that food, because you now only have to serve two meals to that passenger. And most airlines serve you only one meal. If you try, fly in United from New Jersey to Delhi, uh, it's one hot meal and one cold meal over a 12 hour flight. Right. Mm. Uh, so your costs are reduced. Everything, the complexity, everything is reduced. It's, it's simple things like that where it takes time, but it eventually happens. And if you have not reached high-end production, you're really going to get screwed. The lower end of the production cycle you are, the more quickly you're going to get screwed over. So one thing I want to ask you here is what impact will it have on number one scale, second customization in the sense, which will it favor more? Second thing, in terms of human capital, right? What kind of human capital will be required in a 3D printing economy? Like what kind of upskilling or, mm. you know, what skills will be of premium? Okay. Uh, so let's go one by one because you've asked me three questions which have long answers. Uh, so let's do it one by one. What was the first one you asked me? In scale. Okay. Uh, Scale and customization. Yes. Scale, I'm not too sure about right now. Uh, because what it will do is it will simplify the logistics chain and the supply chain. <clears throat> but will it, I mean, will the demand for toothbrushes grow just because it's made in America? I think not. Uh, you know, there's a finite quantity of lower end products that you can consume. But... Once you go to the higher end, so this is like, you know, Giffen goods, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, we've all read the economics about Giffen goods that when the price rises, demand for a Giffen good also rises because uh, you give up the more luxury items and you focus on buying more rice or more wheat because that's all you can afford now. But it's slightly different here in that you're just talking about, I mean, how many toothbrushes are you going to go through? Just because a toothbrush has become one pesa doesn't mean you're going to change your toothbrush every day, right? Uh, on the other hand, people who could not afford a MacBook, uh, it brings down, because of that logistics chain simplification, it brings it down very, very significant. It brings the cost down significantly. And if you don't operate on the Apple principle, which is, add what 6,000% capital just for having that Apple badge on your computer, it democratizes more and more and more advanced technology to people. Now, remember, this also has a negative effect, right? So before, uh, uh, sure, uh, you know, metal was easy to manufacture, but it made metal swords and metal spears, first bronze uh, spears and bronze things, more so, which led to larger scale violence. Uh, then iron comes and that also becomes easy to manufacture and that leads to a whole different kind of violence. Then you have gunpowder, which leads to larger scale violence because there's only so many people you can kill with a sword. Whereas with uh, uh, gunpowder, you can kill a lot more people. With dynamite in an even more compact situation, you can kill many, many more people, which is how you saw the anarchist bombings of the early, of the late 18th and early, uh, 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 sorry, the late uh, uh, 19th and early 20th century. And then, of course, you have nukes that destroy everything, 
Right. So it's kind of those graded options where democratization of technology both has its positives, like say social media and us being able to do this. And it has its negatives in that social media. Everybody tells you it's a great source of disinformation and radicalization and what have you. Uh, nothing's ever just plain good. There's always a mix of good and bad. It's always shades of green, right? Which is very easy for a Hindu to understand because we don't believe in black and white like uh, monotheist religions do anyway. Uh, so the scale will increase in terms of access to higher end stuff if you do not play the branding game. And many people do not play the branding game because most of the market is an Android market of Sasta Masta phones, you know, like 12,000 rupee phones, which can pretty much do the same thing. Not as well as, say, uh, an Apple or a Samsung uh, a phone, but not bad at all. I mean, they can do what's required, right? It's, it's uh, So, for example, the only thing that's really good about this camera is the, uh, about this phone is probably the camera. Okay. Other than that, you tell me, is there a difference of quality in the email you send from an iPhone from one that you send in a, I don't know, what's a cheap phone, me or something like that, which is worth 10,000 rupees? No. You only get the pleasure of saying sent from an iPhone as if that's a great marker of uh, social status or whatever, uh, to saying sent from a cheap Sasta phone that nobody gives a shit about. Uh, so its effects happen in its residual effects in the rest of society. Uh, how it improves the life of everybody around it, like every technological innovation has in the past. So that's scale. Uh, scale as in democratization. Uh, what was the second part of the question? Cust uh, customization. Customization, right. So now... I'm a bit conflicted. I've heard, I've read and seen lots of things that on one hand show me that greater customization is possible. And you want to look at the easiest example of 3D printing as it happens today. If you live in Delhi and if you go to the Uniqlo store here and you take a photo to them, you pick any t-shirt of your choice and they've got a printer that prints it on the t-shirt for you then and there immediately. Right. So that customization becomes cut, cut, cut at one level. On the other hand, it also, sorry, on the same hand, it takes it up to the next level. So for example, if you say uh, my hand, so, so right now all cars come with the say armrest at the same level, right? You can't customize the armrest height. At least the door, Correct. the built in the molded armrest in the door, you can't customize it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, so if you're a six footer, you still have to endure the same armrest and get spondylitis resting your arm like that. Or yeah. if you're a, a four foot midget, you have to rest your arm like that and get spondylitis. Or if you're the average five foot five Indian, then probably you get some comfort Normal. resting it in the correct thing. So here it gives you, because it becomes so cheap, for a few rupees extra, you get a much greater customization of the basic essentials as long as it doesn't compromise the structural integrity of the uh, safety uh, or the safety dynamics of the car. So it will increase the levels of customization. On the other hand, the higher up and higher up, the greater the technology. So th the more democratized the technology levels, the tougher customization becomes uh, because everything is so interconnected. So, you know, one thing can have that butterfly effect on something else somewhere else. Like, you know, the biggest problem with the F-35 was, the F-35 uh, Lightning Fighter was, that the technology was so integrated that every line of software they wrote had some consequences here or there or whatever. And I forget what it was, Windows ME or whatever, that had a whole uh, uh, Microsoft aircraft simulator built into it, which nobody knew about and you couldn't really access, but it slowed the computer down quite significantly. I think it was Windows ME, I forget which one. So, you know, there's all kinds of crap that happens with software complications like that. But let's see, I mean, theoretically, customization is possible. The problem with that kind of customization is when you jerry-rig something, you never know what consequences can happen. And then it will have a lot to do with liability laws. This is why 
you know, the right to repair movement is becoming quite big, especially with phones like Apple or things like that, who do not want their customers to have the right to repair. You have to bring it back to an Apple showroom Correct. for a reason. On the other hand, if you're willing to deal with the catastrophic consequences of self-repair, go ahead and do it. The thing is, it will make the repair a lot easier. When you say, I don't want this here, I want this there. You will not have a computer degree. Before, to move a file from one to another in type computers, you had to write code and move things from here to there. Today, you just drag and drop. That is so simple, right? So it makes that ease of consumer interface customization easier without... You could theoretically built in software to say like, you know, so for example, uh, some websites will not let you right click and download stuff. So you could build in software parameters to what you can do and what you cannot do on a windows interface. So, so literally building something would be as easy. Customizing something would be as e as easy as cut, paste, drag, drop. Right. <laughs> and the human skilling, upskilling part, and what what will be of premium in the so, you know so the, in terms of human resources? So the first example of what you see happening is human skilling. Uh, I saw at the Saab Gripen production line, uh, they managed to cut costs in spite of paying their workers twenty five percent more. Because what happened in the factory was that you had such a highly skilled workforce, you did not require somebody down the line to check your work. You self-check your work. Uh, there are redundancies built in even into that self-check. But you need to have a higher level of education and training in order to check your own work. Okay, and higher, uh, 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 why are those higher levels of training? It's so that your checking is also precise, right? And what happens is your colleague in the next stage around the production line also checks your work. So he has to know his job and he has to know your job. And you eliminated an entire set of factory floor managers who were quite high paid, but now you've delegated the role of kind of not factory floor managers, but step checkers in every process. So it will require significantly higher skilling to do certain things, which some people might be able to do. So for a lot of people, they write their own code. I don't know how to write my own code, but some people do. Some people do their own editing on their computers. I don't know if you do your own editing on your computers. Uh, uh, a lot of people send it out to somebody else to edit. But some people might do their own editing, right? So it gives you that kind of flexibility. It gives you a higher level of specializing and training. And the lower level works, there will really be no work for people to do. You will not have a worker requiring to put bristles into a toothbrush anymore. You might have toothbrush factories without a single worker in it right because everything would be wow. yeah that much that much you just have a quality checker a batch quality checker who will pick up one toothbrush in every batch and check koi defect hai, nahi hai. is the machine malfunction because remember machines also tend to malfunction so it will be more of a quality check and a machine diagnostic process uh, kind of thing that's the optimal end stage of lower end manufacturing that we're looking at Okay. So basically you're saying in a way people will have to be a generalist, understand the entire value chain in the manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they have, there is no delegation of responsibility. The person is the manager and the individual work employee in, uh, in a sense, right? You, you will have to be a generalist with a much higher level of general knowledge. Uh, your, uh, your specialization okay. will be important, but you will have to be much better educated in your specialization and much broader educated in your specialization. Okay, got it. Interesting. So uh, what impact will this have in because you're a geopolitical expert and there is a supply chain issue as well, mm. right? Like there are certain uh, industrial raisins, metal, ceramics, which will be more required in a 3D printing economy. Mm. 
so uh, what geopolitically which country will see higher you know pull in terms of hmm. yeah. so it's it's a double like everything here it's a double edged sword right everything is shades of gray so what happens is you will have <clears throat> on the one hand you will have a further africanization of africa so to say which is you know everybody uses africa as a sort of raw material mine they don't really mm. care about africans yeah. they don't give a shit about africa it's just a place where your uranium and your diamonds come from right so any incentive for them to value add in africa goes completely on the other hand all the rarer metal, the so called rare earths that you require say in siberia or northern china uh, also become more crucially important so on one hand you'll see more military intervention to protect those sources uh probably more conflict and you know why because you know the first thing how how did the eu get formed because europe first formed a coal and steel community after the world war 2 and it was decided because coal and steel were the bigger biggest motivators of war the biggest enablers of war that is the first thing that needs to be nash- uh, uh uh not nationalized but pan europeanized pan european ownership it it can't be national ownership anymore right uh, it's it's a pan european resource and it's not a national resource so in a sense nas- uh, uh, internationalization yeah not nationalization the internationalization of coal and steel that happened in the eu and it was very successful you know why because what the coal and steel community did uh, what was the axis and the allied motivation after world war 2 for the axis it was rehabilitation into the human race after all the genocide they had committed and for the allies it was the containment of germany and what the nas- the internationalization of coal and steel did was it contained germany and it gave germany the ability to rejoin the international community precisely because of that internationalization there was an incentive for it to do it right and there was an incentive for because most of the steel and coal was from germany and from german in the ruhr belt everybody had to agree to rehabilitate germany in order to get its coal and steel out right now how does this work out in the modern world if you do not have an internationalization of these resources you will see renewed intervention in colonialism but also a move towards internationalization which will be resisted under the gar- garb of sovereignty by a lot of countries you could have a cartelization of rare earths like opec so uh, instead of opec you'd have orec organization of rare earth countries i don't know uh which would be a complete or oh, wreck uh, uh kind of a situation shipwreck situation <laughs> uh but yeah. there's many ways this could go down i do not see i think africa is exploited enough in terms of its rare earths and precious metals and minerals and China and Russia are very powerful in their own right and they will resist internationalization using the Africa example saying it's neocolonialism that will be a big uh uh fault line that emerges so there is a prospect for greater peace there's also a prospect for greater war hmm and whenever it comes to supply chains and natural resources india would be lagging in look we in such a we, we, we supply chain issue yeah we we always lag behind in everything you see like uh what uh 3 2 3000 years after the spinning wheel was invented we decide to reinvent the spinning wheel in 1930 or 1940 for our own purposes right <laughs> and our our so called uh, father of the nation imagined india to be a country where every person sits and spins their own uh yeah so you know india is jodi come, come late to, to everything come to think 
come to think of it abhijit zero was also an invention in india and yeah, the spinning so, wheel looks like the zero so exactly so you Double know invention. this is what my friend sushant sarin says that in 732 ad <laughs> uh we were so enamored by our invention of the zero that we decide to collectively reduce ourselves to zero we decide to live like you know uh, there's that whole thing about arjuna uh, being taught satyam vada dharmam chara and everybody learns to recite it immediately but he takes months and months and he can't recite it why because he hasn't internalized it he can recite it but he hasn't learned the lesson to internalize it dhar- satyam vada dharmam chara uh india's like that uh we invented the zero but we have a, we followed in the path of yudhishthira and internalized the zero within ourselves so uh yeah so anyways coming back what socio cultural and religious changes anthropological changes largely in society it's a little bit of crystal ball gazing of mm. course but what do you see happen once 3d printing gets you know like explodes uh for starters i think the idea of protectionism and globalization will see a lot of flux and you'll see political dynamics emerging around that right so for example the american protectionists today uh who tend to vote republican uh will probably turn democrat or it will stop being a political issue because everything gets 3d printed in america so the political discourse will move on to something else some other so you'll see a shift of the political discourse to what we don't know what are the issues that limit so for example technically when the internet came about if we had crystal ball gazed we won't know how the world would look 20 years down the line with the internet on the other hand if we knew how to separate the chaff and this was sure there was no way you could have accurately predicted this you'd have said that you know the creation of the dark net which came very quickly after the net and led to the radicalization and modules of al qaeda al qaeda did dark net radicalization isis did open source social media radicalization right you should have seen probably that this will lead to a greater polarization of society uh we didn't see that coming now we understand the consequences you never understand the consequences of technology till it's too late because that is when it it's when it's too late that the consequences start worrying you and by that time the genie is out of the bottle right so it's impossible to predict this but what i suspect it will lead to first uh, what i know it will lead to the one consequence of this is that backward countries like india and sub saharan africa will be even further backward when compared to the top notch countries the top notch countries will grow geometrically the uh, third world countries will if at all grow arithmetically because at that point market access will mean nothing because remember there's a parallel process happening in those developed countries of hydroponic farming and you know a uh, uh, sustainable farming which happens within america the same globalist who wants to source bananas from africa and dragon fruit from south i don't know if dragon fruits grown in south america but whatever dragon fruit from south america and bananas from africa i don't even know if bananas are grown in africa i think they are yeah they eat plantain yeah so yeah bananas from africa are also the same people who advocate hydroponic farming in high rise buildings out of new york because it reduces the fossil fuel the carbon footprint of the transport of that crops it makes it seasonal local organic what what have you and it's only a matter of time before it becomes cheaper and cheaper and democratized uh it's only a matter of time before lab grown meat essentially elevate uh, uh, eliminates the need for farms and slaughterhouses and butcheries and things like that you have lab grown meat today it is horrendously expensive 
it's like for a little piece of meat it's like a million dollars or something like that but it's only once you put your industrial mind to it think about it which industrialist would not want to invest in a piece of machine that can produce hundreds of steaks or mutton chops or chicken drum sticks at in new york itself without having to own hundreds of acres of farm feed uh, source milk uh, source grass or wheat or whatever the cow is fed uh have to castrate some of the male cows not castrate some of the female cows have a uh, farm hands to look after veterinarians on call to look after uh, uh reach the growing reach 3 4 years of growing uh, uh phase etc 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 when he can grow the lab meat to the exact flavor taste size whatever within about a month or two months in a lab why would you not want to do that so it's only a matter of time before we move towards lab grown meat and uh, hydroponics uh, uh, with minimal carbon footprint food uh combined with 3d printing all of which notice is happening simultaneously so it's not 3d printing by itself it's this move towards farm to table uh lab grown meat plus 3d printing all of it notice it reduce carbon footprint reduce carbon footprint reduce distance reduce length uh, uh reduce the number of people required uh at the same time the guy manning the hydroponic farm is much better educated and trained than a farmer out in the field a guy growing meat in the lab is much better educated than a butcher out in where have you having to do certain things and all of this see is this is why technology makes growth geometric and the lack of technology makes your growth more and more arithmetic but what it does is it also makes market access irrelevant if an indian comes up with a new design he patents the design of the cloth of the t-shirt or whatever he just has to get royalty for the design send it to america and it gets get printed printed as a textile in america you don't need to power loom the textile out here it gets 3d printed out there from cotton fields in tennessee directly you can even have t-shirt 3d printing instead of uniqlo mega stores everywhere or uh, 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 everywhere you could have a uniqlo atm kind of thing on the side of the road where you just go put your photo and it 3d prints it for you then and there right and it could be a multiple access in india we each bank has its own atm in australia i've seen some atms belong to several banks and you can choose which bank to pick from and it dispenses money so you can buy uniqlo you can buy benetton you can buy आजकल कोई बेनेटन खरीदता भी है सॉक्सिन बेनेटन अराउंड बट एनीवे आई डोंट नो डोल्चे एंड गबाना और व्हाटएवर ऑल फ्रॉम द सेम 3D टेक्सटाइल प्रिंटिंग मशीन या सो कमिंग अगेन अभिजीत व्हाट इंपैक्ट डू यू सी ऑन रिलीजन इन सोसाइटी विल इट ड्विंडल डाउन और विल इट चेंज इन अ डिफरेंट वे सो आई थिंक रिलीजन विल फॉलो अ अ ड्यूअल ट्रैक it will exacerbate all the forces you see currently where in very developed societies you enter a post religious phase and in under developed societies you enter phases of greater religious radical uh, radicalization uh simple example christianity in europe is all about turning the other cheek and love right christianity in uganda is all about killing gay people killing witches killing albinos killing it's all about killing in uganda the bible is preached from the old testament in europe even the new testament is censored out in large part and of course nobody goes to church in europe anymore or in a lot of developed countries uh except as a cultural thing you know the baptism of your child just the basic things uh like in a thing it's like 
just for the punal you have your punal cere- the janau ceremony whatever you call it and that's it uh it's like that yeah even marriages are no Got longer it. happening in churches right they're having marriages on the beach marriages civil on marriages. the uh, civil marriages and things like that underwater marriages yeah all kinds of things uh, marriages in space marriages in hot air balloons god knows what not crap <laughs> but uh so so what you'll see is h- how poor countries become poorer because market access will mean nothing europe and america will just say hey you know what we're doing a global free trade agreement because what will happen is once they get 3d technology lab grown meat and hydroponic agriculture going uh it will be so much cheaper than anything produced anywhere else plus the cost of human uh, uh 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 involvement plus the cost of transportation that europeans will of their own free will in a completely open market opt not to buy indian mangoes chinese bananas or chinese mobile phones or whatever because it's available locally cheaper everything right so you'll get to the point where market access probably means nothing and so what can you realistically achieve a lot of our export economy will go china will actually get hit a lot harder because they are so export driven much more so than india is india has a large internal economy of its own so india will in fact get more protectionist because the cost of importing a 3d printed thing from europe will actually become much cheaper than a local human production toothbrush or whatever so you'll see production which was shifted out low and medium end production which was shifted out to third world countries shift back to first world countries and they'll almost become self reliant largely except on minerals now it gives the mineral producers a great amount of leverage if you're a strong state like russia or china or like saudi arabia if you're a weak state like central african republic or burkina faso or mauritania or niger you are screwed you are literally screwed i can see only maybe five countries in africa two of which have no minerals so seychelles and mauritius have no minerals to export uh, uh but three countries uh which do have something to export I, i don't know if rwanda has anything to export i think rwanda will also get hit hard but botswana and namibia which are mineral rich south africa is now a basket case right because south africa the moment nelson mandela came you knew he was going to be uh mugabe junior he just didn't live as long as mugabe did but uh, uh uh right from the beginning you know he was going down the mugabe path uh uh so you know and they've gone down the mugabe path and they've reduced south africa to basically like zimbabwe uh you, you will need a strong state in control of minerals and the west's propensity its control of soft power and narrative will be used much the same way as it was through the 18th and 19th centuries and the early 20th centuries to create corporate monopolies on the extraction of minerals and reduce the power of the state so for example when egypt nationalized the suez canal uh europe well france and britain did everything to prevent their nationalization uh when iran wanted to nationalize its oil uh the americans and british staged a coup out there uh, that was the mossadegh government right uh etc 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 so you will see a renewed intervention in the guise of uh altruism which was called the white man's burden and civilizing the native savages these days it's called spreading democracy and values based diplomacy which of course uh, the uh, dumb fucks in the me are actually uh, dumb enough to actually believe that crap and the fall for this value based uh, yeah uh, the, the bullshit world order and look today i want everybody to watch cnn 
And look at the vitriol it spews against OPEC ever since the decision to cut 2 million barrels of oil last week or early this week. Now, prices were always determined by the big six oil companies, which were all Western owned. They used to determine the supply and market for oil. ExxonMobil, Shell, Chevron, I think. Exxon and Shell, I knew. But uh, I don't know who the other companies are. But they British used to petroleum determine. Petroleum one. Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, uh, six companies used to determine it. And when countries became, when uh, decolonization happened and countries became their own masters, uh, what is OPEC? OPEC is essentially those big six being replaced by 10, 12 countries. Companies being replaced by countries. And so I suspect you'll come across a lot of academic bullshit literature which will talk about the need for removing the focus on state control of minerals and going back to non-state control of minerals. You will see a lot of focus on indigenous rights, that indigenous communities should maintain the minerals they sit upon. And this will become, so right to protect human rights intervention, essentially, will become, will be extended to human rights intervention for local communities to control local resources. Mm. Lots of danger. So see, the, the, the fun thing is, being a defense and foreign policy analyst, my job is never going to end. I think I'm the most secure person because there will always be these Ever, ever em- emerging diplomatic and uh, security challenges. Uh, I think my occupation is the safest occupation on earth. It's the most insulated occupation. I never thought about this, but I decided, like, got into it. I got into it because I loved planes and tanks and anything that went boom. But I now realize I kind of set up job security and... You will... Uh, you will be paid higher, Abhijit. Okay. So, yeah, uh, going ahead, you all uh, oftentimes mentioned about the interlink- interlinkages between 3D printing, blockchain, cryptocurrency. Uh, briefly, if you can say what, uh, you know, what exactly would that be like? Like what interlinkages do you see in them? Okay, uh, so blockchain basically brings about a whole new level of contract enforcement. So it makes, uh, you know, regulatory mechanisms a lot easier when you add it with cryptocurrencies because cryptocurrencies are virtual currencies which are very easy to monitor. Theoretically. Theoretically, they shouldn't be open to speculation, which we've seen is not true. That's, you know, you, I mean, you've seen how... Yeah, uh, cryptocurrencies have tumbled in the last uh, a year, uh, two years kind of thing. But they definitely remove power away from the state. But what about a state-sponsored, not a cryptocurrency, but an online currency or a multilateral currency? Yeah. Right. Uh, that combined with the sort of how crypto enables escrow and automaticity of payments based on third party verifying. So, you know, it goes into an escrow account and it's not the government deciding if the contractor has delivered, but it's completely independent verifiers saying that it is delivered and the blockchain access that you get, uh, you know, a government will not be able to take that money back without the blockchain enabling it to take it back based on arbitration outside. So it actually makes the governments more accountable in a way. Right. Uh, it'll make currency more transparent based on demand and supply. Uh, I doubt if you'll be able to manipulate currency. I mean, there's different forms of cryptocurrency. We don't know which. See, the problem here is, uh, you remember 99% of car manufacturers went bankrupt. Nobody's even heard of them anymore. Uh, most plane manufacturers in our own lifetimes went bankrupt. You know, once upon a time, today, if you go anywhere, you will only see there Boeing are just or four, Airbus. No? And there are two or big Embraer and two small. And Bombardier. That's no, it. So two big and two small. Correct. Boeing and Airbus and Embraer and Bombardier. Okay. Now, before, there used to be hundreds of plane manufacturers. 
there was a uh, Foka Wolf, there was Messerschmitt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was Blériot in France. There was Vosin in France. There was De Havilland. Uh, there was Watt. There was McDonald Douglas. Uh, there was, uh, so in the 50s and 60s, you literally had 20, 30 plane manufacturers. By the 80s and 90s, it had come down to about five, six manufacturers because you had Illusion, you had Tupolov, uh, in, uh, Russia, in China, you had, uh, two of them. In, uh, uh, uh Japan, you had a local, uh, plane produced. Yeah. In, uh, I forget, uh, which one, uh, in, uh, Europe, you had Aerospatial and, uh, British Aerospace, uh, uh, the BSE Concord, remember, uh, Aerospatial plus, uh, British Aerospace, uh, uh, collaborating, uh, 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 there was the BSE Comet, uh, I think, was it the BSE Comet or was it the De Havilland Comet? I forget. Uh, uh, you know, you had, uh, Canadian De Havilland and European De Havilland, you had McDonald Douglas. I mean, you know, even till about even today, you have some McDonald Douglas MD so eleven and MD twelve flying, right? They consolidated, or they just went so bankrupt they all consolidated and left. Into- right. So you never know which one is going to survive and which model of a cryptocurrency is going to survive. Kiska business model survive karega? We don't know. But I that survive my pr- my model prediction is that plus blockchain. Plus 3D printing, just like when you combine it with hydroponics and lab-grown meat, will change a heck of a lot. I think. Oh, oh, okay, okay. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, what I was saying was that I probably feel this every state will have its own digital cryptocurrency, you know, so that they have some levers of control. That's how I see it. Eventually, the state will get into regulating crypto and it will have its own crypto. That's how I feel it will happen eventually. Uh, So I think it will become electronic currency. It won't be cryptocurrency anymore because once it's state, a state can't have a cryptocurrency, right? A state has an e-currency. I mean, technically it's not crypto. But can you say that there is this finite amount? Because the thing about, uh, what was that first cryptocurrency? Bitcoin. Bitcoin, there were only so many Bitcoins ever uh, minted, so to say, right? And which is why the value of each, as Bitcoin's overall value keeps increasing, the value of each coin keeps going up. And it becomes ah, harder and harder to mine a Bitcoin. It's almost becomes like a gold standard. There's a reason why we moved to fiat, right? So I, exactly. it's like going exactly. back to the gold. So it's, 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 see, it's probably not. It's very hard to predict because see, gold is backed by something. A, a gold standard is backed by something. It, well, a gold standard Here is backed enough. by gold. Huh. What huh. is backing this? It, it, it's a notional backing. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's worse, actually. It's a worse it, form of the gold yeah, standard. Yeah, it's, it, it's, so let's see what comes out of it. I'm, if you notice, I've never really been bullish about crypto. When everybody was going crypto, 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 I, I did you ever find me one podcast that I've ever done where I've been bullish about crypto? No, I don't. I, the only memory I have of you talking about crypto is with regards to blockchain and 3D printing. I've yeah, never seen combined. Talk. Yeah. Combined. Yeah. So anyways, uh, also, Abhijit, there's a very interesting sociological change that is happening, which is that fertility rates worldwide are dropping across without an exception, right? So in a world where 3D printing is going to grow and the fertility rates are dropping, uh, don't you think joblessness or loss of jobs should not be that like it's kind of balancing itself out? Do you see that Con- some kind of convergence? Mm. Uh, not really. Uh, joblessness uh, may become less. Again, it's geometric in a developed country because you already have a very good education system. The amount required for that extra training is minimal. Right. Uh, you'll in fact reduce workplace friction significantly. So like in America, you won't have a problem of pronouns because you may not even see your coworker. And you might be earning twice of what you earned once upon a time because your training is that much higher. 
on the other hand in a place like india or sub saharan africa uh with your loss of market access your inability to catch up your inability to be economically efficient what do you think is going to happen it's going to get a lot worse uh and the amount of catching up you have to do see when you're catching up to here from here the effort required is minimal but when you're catching up from here to here the effort is gigantic so every cycle of industrialization you miss your task becomes more and more herculean and then i hear all these idiots who should really know better go about saying oh we bypassed the industrial age to enter the information age to janta bhi hai ki information age kya hai kya what are the building blocks of the information to pehle seekh le information is not just information it is also the technology that goes into the information industrialization ke bagair abhi tak there is only one company you know called asml that prints that has the machines to print microchips it's a dutch company it's the one company you have never heard of which is the single most crucial company on earth and it is the only one that produces machines that print microchips and the technology most important to that microchip which is why you would have never heard of it which you might have heard of is carl zeiss because it requires a surgical optical equipment to print it and only carl zeiss can produce that extreme optical precision required for that particular printing and notice it comes out of germany precision manufacturing and not out of america right so and this is why germany did not so you know like america nobody buys american cars i mean american cars are red shit who the hell would buy an i mean given a choice between a mercedes and an american car do you think anybody assume i gave you a mercedes and a chrysler free of cost what would you I've choose i've never seen a chrysler on indian roads it won't they, survive a day i think on indian well, roads they 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 were on indian roads they who got rebranded as chrysler in india but they left nobody was buying it uh but uh kya hua ki uh given an a choice anybody given a choice between a merc and a chrysler what would they choose a merc right uh so nobody is buying american cars but everybody is buying american planes why because america did not focus on cars but it focused on a much higher end technology for planes which is why it dominates the aircraft market and the higher the technology the more the american dominant so fighters for example europe doesn't have an equivalent fighter to the f35 at all right on the other hand germany produces this and holland produces this and the americans used to keep make fun of teutonic quality focus when today they are the only ones between carl zeiss and asml that can produce a microchip printing machine uh so, so see the catching up is so phenomenal that that is the enabler of your information age see people are confusing the symptoms of the information age with the technological causes of the information age so the next time you see some saying we will we have bypassed the industrial revolution to uh, enter the information age ben chod what is the value added that this podcast is creating compared to what asml is doing in, we, we are today able to do this because asml is able to print a microchip our value add here is next to zero ASML's value add ninety nine point nine nine percent of the value of this podcast is brought by that ASML chip, out of which this would not even be possible. Yeah, na. So when I hear this kind of shit, it just shows the absolutely trashy level of human capital that we have. That we we talk such bullshit, we're not even able to diagnose. a uh, cause and we can't separate cause and symptom that you think bpos are the information age that call center worker is the manifestation of an information age i have literally I, you, you know this is where there is very little difference between uh, uh, the prime minister of india and the sheikh of timbuktu they seem to have a very similar level of technological understanding 
so it's it's going to get tougher and tougher and tougher and tougher if you had industrialized before the digital age you maybe had this much to achieve which is why russia the ussr stalin was able to industrialize very very rapidly okay because it's a simple question of design manufacture and metallurgy which is still very complicated but it's still easier as the complexity of the economy goes and the complexity of production goes up this is why russia has never been able to catch up and even china despite its huge reserves is having problem catching up to the kind of technology development in the west now ye dekho the westosphere as i call it is about 1.1 billion people what do i mean by the westosphere nato europe and everybody that buys american military equipment so israel north america uh uh australia japan korea uh uh singapore all of this would be the westosphere total population 1.1 billion the last i checked their average per capita income was 43000 dollars per capita theek hai if you even out population and income 43000 dollars per capita 1.1 billion people compared to 1.3 billion people in india at 2000 dollars per capita or 1.3 billion people in china with uh, uh 10000 dollars per capita even the statistics don't add up no. so so you see Abhiji- the, 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 there's a fundamental problem out here which when your understanding of the problem itself is so primitive and pre-industrial when you can't even gauge what the problem is how do you solve it it's like giving a calculus problem to a humanities graduate sin theta plus cot theta plus tan theta divided by uh, uh equals what to a fellow who's done a phd in gandhi and jute weaving uh, uh, uh patterns gender studies well, gender studies uh no but see the so gender studies guy in- actually has a comeback for it they'll say that your question itself is patriarchal <laughs> so that is a skill set that they have which will impute that because of your brahminical privilege you are able to frame this question and you are engaging in <laughs> gender violence against them by posing the question to them and all of this is because of your brahminical privilege so they have a way I, of come back a, but a person who's done ha- yeah, the- in gandhi and jute weaving what are they going to say they'll f-ing spin the charkha and say hari om hari om hari om it's like uh, the gender studies person or the linguist will say that oppressive uh, power structures in your linguistic syntax some word yeah, salad like that god yeah so anyways uh, finally what's the news for india you're saying that natural resources we don't have so there is no competitive edge there you're saying that human resources we don't have so there is no competitive edge there you're saying that manufacturing processes or specializations in that we don't have even in the industrial age to be able to graduate there what will be india's sustainable every country has to have something in this value chain that it can you know hold as a prestigious thing for which others need it what will mm-hmm. that be for india realistically uh, s- realistically spirituality and the ability to abstract the famines and economic ruin that's going to visit you you accept that it is your fate uh, you do ram bharose you sing bhaj govindam every day and uh, when your children are dying of starvation and famine you attribute it to supernatural causes and talk about your great spiritual inheritance and heritage basically you're like there's no silver lining there's no silver lining here there's no silver lining we had a chance maybe in the okay. 70s the 80s i was hoping against hope that 2014 was going to be our last chance even of la- last ditch industrialization which have, which would have still 
it might not have gotten up to China's level here, but even up to here, which would kind of enable some level of here, but no. thankfully, because I smoke so uh, and I eat lots of meat and I'm obese, I'll probably die of uh, cholesterol or cancer within the next 20 years and I won't have to see it. But if all of you who lead a healthy, vegan, uh, organic natural lifestyle who are going to live up to 90, 100, 120, whatever. Get ready to see starvation, misery, whatever in your streets. Congratulations to you. I This is why I started smoking and eating copious quantities of meat because I'd much rather die than see that. Anyways, uh, Okay, so on that very uh, pessimistic note, we usually end this podcast on a slightly optimistic note, but it seems like this diagnosis has no uh, no good outcome left. But uh, there is lots to ponder over from this podcast. So no, I we, hope so, the so, so audience... See, will, see, the thing here is we should always end on an optimistic note. So anyways, on that note, we come to the close of this episode. Thank you so much, Abhijit. will be good to have you here again. 